the Grand Inquisitor, or the Christian statesman as Jesus Hunter and the birth of the institutional doctrine out of the spirit of cynicism. A quote from Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov. That's it precisely, the but called Ivan, so that you know, novice, what is senseless is all too necessary on earth. The world is based on the senseless, and without it, probably nothing at all would happen on earth. I know what I know. And according to my lamentable, earthly, Euclidean understanding, I know only that suffering exists, but no one is guilty, that everything follows immediately and simply one from the other, that everything flows and evens itself out. But that is only Euclidean nonsense. What do I gain by the fact that there are no guilty ones, that everything follows immediately and simply one from the other, and that I know that I need retribution, and otherwise I will annihilate myself? Listen, if all have to suffer and with their suffering procure eternal harmony, what do children have to do with that? Why have they too been caught up in the material and have to serve as the manure for someone's future harmony? Dostoevsky's gloomy Grand Inquisitor, too, is only apparently a figure of the Christian Middle Ages, just as Goethe's Mephistopheles is only apparently still a Christian devil. In reality, both belong to the modernity of the 19th century. The one is aesthetician and evolutionist, the other is representative of a new cynical political conservatism. Like Faust, the Grand Inquisitor is a retrospective projection of advanced ideological tensions from the 19th to the 16th century. Intellectually, as well as chronologically, he stands closer to figures like Hitler and Goebbels, Stalin and Lunacharsky, than to the historical Spanish Inquisition. But is it not frivolous to place an honourable Christian cardinal in such company? The defamation weighs heavily, it must be justified by strong evidence. This is provided by the Grand Inquisitor's story, as Ivan Karamazov tells it. The Cardinal and Grand Inquisitor of Seville, an ascetic old man of ninety years within whom all life seems to be extinguished except in his eyes a dark ember still glows, one day became, became as Ivan tells us in his fantastic poem, a witness to the return of Christ. Before the cathedral, Jesus had repeated his miracle of long ago, and with a soft word had brought a dead child to life. It seems as if the old man had immediately comprehended the significance of this act, but his reaction is paradoxical. Instead of paying homage to the returned Lord, he points his bony finger at him and orders the watchman to arrest the man and lock him up in the vault of the holy tribunal. In the night, the old man descends the stairs to Jesus in the dungeon and says, Is it you? You? But receiving no answer, he adds quickly, Do not answer, be silent. And indeed, what can you say? I know too well what you would say. Besides, you have no right to add anything to what you have said already in the days of old. Well, why then did you come to disrupt us? For you have come to disrupt and you know it. But do you know what is going to happen tomorrow? I know not who you are and I don't want to know, whether it is you or only someone who looks like him. I do not know, but tomorrow I shall condemn you and burn you at the stake as the vilest of heretics. And the same people who today kissed your feet will at the first sign from me rush to rake up the coals at your stake tomorrow. Do you know that? Yes, perhaps you do know it. Those who find the Grand Inquisitor's behaviour strange will be even more curious about the meaning of the event when they have understood the decisive point with the greatest possible sharpness. In the thinking and action of the old man, there is not a trace of dimness or blindness, no error, no misunderstanding. What Jesus had assumed about his crucifiers as grounds for forgiveness, for they know not what they do, can in no way be applied to the churchman. He knows what he is doing, and he knows it with a downright shocking clarity, regarding which the only remaining question is whether it should be called tragic or cynical. If the Grand Inquisitor knows what he is doing, 
then he must be acting for reasons of overpowering gravity, reasons that are strong enough to dislodge the religious faith he outwardly represents. The old man does in fact give Jesus his reasons. To be concise, his speech is the reply of a politician to the founder of a religion. Seen somewhat more deeply, it is a settling of accounts of anthropology with theology, of administration with emancipation, of the institution with the individual. We have just heard the main accusation against the returned one. He has come to disrupt. In what? The Inquisitor blames his saviour for returning precisely at the moment when the Catholic Church, through the terror of the Inquisition, was about to stamp out the last sparks of Christian freedom, and was also able to delude itself into believing that it had completed its work, establishing domination through the true religion. Having become completely unfree, in the religious political sense, the people of this time are more than ever convinced that they are free. Did they not possess the truth? Had not Christ promised that the truth will make us free? The Grand Inquisitor, however, can see through this deception. He's proud of his realism. As representative of the victorious church, he claims not only to have completed Jesus' work, but still more to have improved it. For Jesus, so he says, did not know how to think politically, and had not comprehended what human nature in a political respect required, namely, domination. In the speech of Dostoevsky's cardinal to his silent prisoner, we discover one of the origins of modern institutionalism, which in this passage, and perhaps only in this passage, admits in a remarkably open way its cynical basis and conscious deception that appeals to necessity. The powerful, according to Dostoevsky's profound and vertiginous reflections, make the following calculations. Only a few possess the courage to be free, as Jesus demonstrated when he answered the question of the tempter in the desert, concerning why he did not, although he was hungry, transform stones into bread. Man does not live by bread alone. Only a few have the power to overcome hunger. The many in all ages will reject the offer of freedom in the name of bread. In other words, people in general are in search of disburdenment, ease, comfort, routine, security. Those invested with power can, in all ages, confidently assume that the great majority have a horror of freedom, and know no deeper urge than to surrender their freedom to erect prisons around themselves, and to subjugate themselves to idols old and new. What can the master Christians, the representatives of a religion of freedom, do in such a situation? The Grand Inquisitor understands his assuming power as a kind of self-sacrifice. But we shall tell them that we do your bidding and rule in your name. We shall deceive them again, for we shall not let you come near us again. That deception will be our suffering, for we shall be forced to lie. We are witnesses here of a unique, strangely convoluted thought experiment in which the paradoxes of modern conservatism are hatched. The churchman raises his anthropological protest against the unreasonable demand of freedom that the founder of the religion has left behind. For human life, frail as it is, needs first of all an ordered framework of habit, certainty, law and tradition, in a word, social institutions. With breathtaking cynicism, the Grand Inquisitor accuses Jesus not of having abolished the discomfort of freedom, but of having aggravated it. He has not accepted human beings as they are, but has overstrained them with his love. To this extent, the later masters of the church have superseded Christ in their sort of love of humanity, which is thoroughly pervaded by contempt and realism, for they take human beings as they are, childlike and childish, indolent and weak. The system of a ruling church, however, can only be erected on the shoulders of people who take the moral burden of conscious deception on themselves. That is 
priests who consciously preach the opposite of the actual teachings of Christ, which they have understood precisely. To be sure, they speak the Christian language of freedom, but they serve the system of needs, bread, order, power, law, that makes people submissive. The concept of freedom, as the Grand Inquisitor knows, is the fulcrum in the system of oppression. The more repressive it is, inquisition, etc., the more violently must the rhetoric of freedom be hammered into people's heads. Precisely this is the ideological stamp of all modern conservatisms in the East as well as in the West. They are all based on pessimistic anthropologies, according to which the striving for freedom is nothing more than a dangerous illusion, a mere basically insubstantial urge that glosses over the necessary and ineluctable institutional bound character of human life. Wherever in the world today theories of freedom and emancipation make themselves heard, they are repudiated with words like the following from the Grand Inquisitor. But here, too, your judgment of people was too high, for they are slaves, though rebels by nature. Look around you and judge. Fifteen centuries have passed. Go and have a look at them. Whom have you raised up to yourself? Oh, I swear, human beings have been created weaker and baser creatures than you thought them to be. In respecting them so greatly, you acted as though you ceased to feel any compassion for them. This is still formulated in moral clauses, the Magna Carta of a, of a theoretical conservatism on an anthropological foundation. Arnold Galen probably would have undersigned it without hesitation. Even the rebellious element in human beings is included as a natural constant in the calculations of this detached pessimism. Dostoevsky's Grand Inquisitor speaks as conservative politician and ideologue of the 19th century, looking back on the storms of European history since 1789. They will tear down the temples and drench the earth with blood, but they will realise at last, the foolish children, that although they are rebels, they are impotent rebels who cannot bear their own rebellion. Unrest, confusion and unhappiness, that is the lot of people today. But that is not enough. The final ascent to the yawning heights, Sinoviev, of a cynically conceived conservative politics still lies before us. When the Grand Inquisitor reaches his most extreme confession, when power tells its trade secrets in the most shameless and audacious way, that is the moment of that higher shamelessness through which inbred disingenuousness finds its way back to truth. In the mouth of the Grand Inquisitor, Dostoevsky's reflections across the cynical threshold beyond which there is no way back for the no longer naive consciousness. In the mouth of the Grand Inquisitor, Dostoevsky's reflections cross the th cynical threshold beyond which there is no way back for the no longer naive consciousness. He admits that the church long ago consciously sealed a pact with the devil, that tempter in the desert, whose offer of worldly domination Jesus himself had rejected at that time. According to the cardinal's admission, the church was, with open eyes, gone over to the devil's camp. At that time it decided to take the sword of worldly power into its hands in the time of Charlemagne. It paid for it with an unhappy conscience, unhappy consciousness, and a chronically split conscience. But that it had to do it is, in spite of everything, beyond the question for the great politician. He speaks like someone who knows that he has sacrificed a great deal. And as it could not be otherwise, it is a sacrifice on the altar of the future, nourished by the spirit of utopia. This is a sign that allows us to date this thought with certainty in the 19th century, which made every form of evil thinkable if only it served a good purpose. The Grand Inquisitor is enraptured with the vision of a humanity united by Christianity, 
welded together by power and inquisition. This vision alone gives him something to hold on to and hides his cynicism from himself, or better, ennobles it to a sacrifice. Millions upon millions of people will happily enjoy their existence, free from all guilt, and only the powerful, who make the sacrifice of exercising seminal, cynical domination, will be the last unhappy ones. For we alone, we who guard the mystery, we alone shall be unhappy. There will be thousands of millions of happy infants and 100,000 sufferers who have taken upon themselves the curse of knowledge of good and evil. Perplexing analogies between Goethe and Dostoevsky now become visible. Both talk of a pact with the devil. Both conceive of evil as imminence. Both rehabilitate Satan and acknowledge his necessity. Dostoevsky's devil, too, stated concisely the principle of power, world dominion, is conceived as a part of a power that wills evil but brings forth good. For good is also supposed to arise, finally, from the Grand Inquisitor's gloomy labour, as his concluding utopia shows. In both cases, to conclude a pact with the devil means nothing more than to become a realist. That is, to take the world and people as they are. And in both cases it is and in both cases it is a matter of the power that must be dealt with by all those who let themselves in for this kind of realism. With Faust, this is the power of knowledge. With the Grand Inquisitor, the knowledge of power. Knowledge and power are the two modes by which one reaches the modern state beyond good and evil. And in that moment when the consciousness takes the step into this beyond, cynicism is unavoidably on the scene. With Goethe, aesthetically. With Dostoevsky, morally and politically. With Marx, embodied in a philosophy of history. With Nietzsche, psychologically and vitalistically. With Freud, sexually and psychologically. Here we have zeroed in on the point where cynicism and enlightenment touch, for enlightenment furthers the empirical realistic disposition, and where this advances without obstruction, it inevitably leaves the limits of morality behind. Realistic thinking must constantly use an amoral freedom in order to attain clarity. A science of reality becomes possible only where metaphysical dualism has been ruptured, where the inquiring spirit has constructed a consciousness beyond good and evil, where, without metaphysical and moral prejudice, neutral and tedious, it searches for what is the case. Would the Grand Inquisitor then be a co-founder of positivistic political science? that takes humankind empirically, and from its circumstances determines the kind of political institutions that are necessary for its survival. For Dostoevsky, the institution of church is only representative of those coercive institutions that regulate social life, their apex being occupied by the state and the army. It is the spirit of these institutions that is abhorred by any recollection of the magnificent, primitive Christian freedom. It is not religion as religion that has to burn the returned Christ, but religion as church, as analogue of the state, as institution. It is the state that fears the civil disobedience the religious are capable of. It is the army that condemns the spirit of Christian pacifism. It is the masters of the world of work who have a horror of people who place love, celebration of life and creativity higher than slaving for the state, the rich, the army, etc. Accordingly, must the Grand Inquisitor in Dostoevsky's narrative burn Jesus the meddler as he intended? To be perfectly consistent? Yes. But let us hear how the story ends when... Ivan Karamazov tells it. 
I intended to end it as follows. When the Inquisitor has finished speaking, he waits for some time for the prisoner's reply. His silence distresses him. He sees that the prisoner has been listening intently to him all the time, looking gently into his face and evidently not wishing to say anything in reply. The old man would like him to say something, however bitter and terrible. But he suddenly approaches the old man and kisses him gently on his bloodless, aged lips. That is his entire answer. The old man gives a start. There is an imperceptible movement as the corners of his mouth. He goes to the door, opens it and says to him, Go and come no more. Don't come at all. Never. Never. And he lets him go out into the dark streets and lanes of the city. The prisoner goes away. Dostoevsky obviously guards against giving an unambiguous solution. Probably because he saw that one way or the other, the game is not over. For a moment, nevertheless, the church politician must admit defeat. For one second he sees the other, the infinite affirmation that includes even him, and that neither judges nor condemns. Dostoevsky's Jesus loves not only his enemy, but, what is considerably more complicated, also him who betrays and perverts him. However, one may interpret the open end of the drama, and in any case demonstrates it in any case demonstrates that Dostoevsky recognizes a conflict between two principles or forces that balance each other. Indeed, even more, they neutralize each other. By suspending any decision, he puts himself de facto in the region beyond good and evil. That is, in that area where we can do nothing other than take facts and reality positively as they are. Institutions follow their own logic. Religion follows another. And the realist is well advised to seriously take both into account without forcing a decision for one side or the other. The actual result of the Grand Inquisitor's cynical reasoning is not so much the self-exposure of the church politician, but the discovery that good and evil, end and means, can be interchanged. This result cannot be overemphasized. With it, we slide inevitably into the area of cynicism, for it means nothing less than that religion can just as easily be made an instrument of politics as politics can be made an instrument of religion. Because this is so, everything that was held to be absolute now comes into a relative light. Everything becomes a question of the lighting, the viewing angle, the projection, the purpose intended. All absolute anchoring is gone. The age of moral teetering begins. Beyond good and evil, we by no means find, as Nietzsche assumed, a radically vital amoralism, but rather an infinite twilight and a fundamental ambivalence. Evil becomes so-called evil as soon as it is thought of as a means to good. Good becomes so-called good as soon as it appears to be something disruptive. Jesus as disruptor. Destructive in the sense given to it by the institutions. Good and evil, viewed in a metaphysical light, transmute unflinchingly into each other, and those who have come so far as to see things this way gain a tragic view that, as we show here, is really a cynical view. For as soon as the metaphysical distinction between good and evil becomes outmoded, and everything that exists appears neutral in a metaphysical sense, only then does modernity, as we refer to it, really begin. It is the age that can no longer conceive of any transcendental morality, and that, consequently, finds it impossible to distinguish neatly between means and ends. From then on, all statements about ends, and especially about final ends, appear as ideologies, and what earlier were ideals and moral doctrines are now transparent and useful intellectual apparatuses. Morals and consciousnesses of values consequently can be studied like things, namely as subjective entities. Consciousness, a later terminology will use the concept subjective factor, is thus no longer the wholly other, the opposed principle, in relation to external being, but is itself a part of being, a part of reality. One can study it, describe it historically, pull it apart analytically, and the decisive point 
use it politically and economically. From this moment on, a new hierarchy arises. On the one hand, the naive, the believers in values, the ideologized, the deceived, the victims of their quote-unquote own imaginations. In a word, the people with false consciousness, the manipulated and the manipulable. This is the mass, the spiritual realm of animals, to quote Hegel. The region is false and unfree consciousness. All those have succumbed to it who do not possess the great free, correct consciousness. But who has the correct consciousness? Its bearers are to be found in a reflecting elite of non-naive people who no longer believe in values, who have overcome ideology and have dissolved the deception. They are the ones who are no longer manipulable, who think beyond good and evil. Everything now depends on whether this intellectual hierarchy is also a political hierarchy. Thus on whether the non-naive people are, in relation to the naive, the rulers. With the Grand Inquisitor the answer would be a clear-cut yes. However, are all enlightened people, all realists, all non-naive people essentially Grand Inquisitors? That is, ideological manipulators and moral deceivers who use their knowledge about things to rule others, even for their purported good? Well, it is in our own interest not to demand a quick answer to this question. The Grand Inquisitor, as we said, is a prototype of modern political cynics. His bitter anthropology prompts him to believe that human beings must be and want to be deceived. Human beings require order, which in turn requires domination, and domination requires lies. Those who want to rule must accordingly make conscious use of religion, ideals, seduction, and, if necessary, violence. For them, everything, even the sphere of ends, becomes a means. Modern grand politicians are total instrumentalists and disposers of values. Nevertheless, in spite of all this, one cannot say that they are obscurantists. In the framework of Dostoevsky's story, the role of realist falls to those who surrender their insights. Their garrulous cynicism thus remains an absolutely indispensable factor in the process of truth. If they were really just deceivers, they would keep silent. However, in the final analysis, they too think that they are doing the right thing, even if they employ crooked means to this end. Their maxims resemble Claudel's motto, God writes straight, even on crooked lines. In the last instance, they have not given up the tendency towards good. Made to speak, they give an account of their motives and their confessions, although Gideon are invaluable contributions to the search for truth. In a roundabout way, cynics contribute what they can towards enlightenment. Indeed, without their spectacular, amoral and evilly clever self-exposures, the entire area would remain impenetrable precisely because an impression of naked reality can only be gained from a standpoint beyond good and evil. We must rely in the, in the search for truth on the amoral, self-reflective statements of those who have assumed such standpoints. From Rousseau to Freud, existentially crucial knowledge has become expressed in the form of confessions. One has to go behind the facade to recognise what is really the case. Cynicism speaks of what is behind the facade, that becomes possible when the feeling of shame ceases. Only when individuals have taken the step beyond good and evil for themselves can they make a productive confession. But when they each say, I am thus, they mean basically, it is thus. My sins fall not on me, but on it within me. They are only sinful illusions. In reality, my evil is only a part of a universal reality, where good and evil disappear in a grand neutrality. Because truth means more than morality, amoralists justifiably do not necessarily feel themselves to be bad. They serve a higher authority than morality. From this perspective, 
the Grand Inquisitor becomes a figure typical of the epoch. His thinking is dominated by two antagonistic motives that simultaneously conflict with and condition each other. As a realist, positivist, he has left the dualism of good and evil behind. As a man of utopia, he holds on to realism all the more grimly. Half of him is an amoralist, the other a hypermoralist, on the one hand cynic, on the other dreamer. Here, freed from all scruples, there bound to the idea of an ultimate good. In praxis, he does not recoil from any cruelty, infamy, or deception. In theory, the highest ideals rule him. Reality has taught him to be a cynic, pragmatist, and strategist. However, because of his intentions, he feels himself to be goodness incarnate. In this fragmentation and double-tonguedness, we recognise the basic structure of realistic grand theories of the 19th century. They obey a compulsion to compensate for every gain in realism, amoralism, with an assault on utopia and substitute morality, as if it were unbearable to accumulate so much power of knowledge and knowledge of power, if extremely good ends did not justify this accumulation. The Grand Inquisitor's speech reveals to us at the same time where these extremely good ends, which justify everything, come from, from the historical future, at the end of history. Thousands of millions of happy infants will populate the world, coerced into their happiness and enticed into paradise by the few who rule them. However, until then we have a long way to go, a way that will be lined by countless pyres. But since the end is considered absolutely right, no price seems too high to reach it. If the end is absolutely good, its goodness must rub off even on the most horrible means they have to be employed along the way. Here, total instrumentalism, there, utopia. That is a form of new, cynical theodicy. That is the form of a new, cynical theodicy. Human suffering thereby is attributed an overarching historical tendency. Suffering becomes, frankly put, an unavoidable function of progress. Suffering is strategy. Mind you, suffering in the form of causing to suffer, inquisition. The strategist suffers only insofar as he knows that he consciously deceives. The reason for presenting the Grand Inquisitor here now becomes clear. He is really a bourgeois philosopher of history, with a Russian Orthodox profile a tragically vilified crypto-Hegelian. If one wants to imagine the worst consequence, one must imagine what would happen if a Russian politician like the Grand Inquisitor came face to face with the most powerful and most realistic philosophy of history in the 19th century. Marxism. But it is not necessary to imagine this because the encounter between the Great Inquisition and Marxism has in fact taken place. We need only to page through the East European history of this century to come across at least two larger-than-life hybrid figures of the type Marxist Grand Inquisitor, Utopian Grand Cynic. Whether this encounter was necessary or was based on a misunderstanding is beside the point. From a historical perspective, the coalescence of Marxist ideology and Grand Inquisition cannot be retraced even if good reasons could be given to show why the Russification of Marxism actually represents a curiosity, namely the reckless, illegitimate perversion of a theory of liberation into an instrument of the most rigorous oppression. This process can only become understandable from the cynically inverted optics of Dostoevsky's Grand Inquisitor. Only such optics give a logically explicit model for interpreting the phenomenon. Those who want to rule use the truth in order to lie. Those who deceive the masses in the name of the truth, and Marxism undeniably possesses strong elements of truth, risk, at least in theory, no repudiation. However, like the Grand Inquisitor, modern rulers must say to a returned Marx, we will no longer let you come into our midst. We will cite you as our authority, 
but only on the irrevocable condition that you never, never come again. For no matter who came, he himself or only his image, he would inevitably be a troublemaker, and we know all too well what happens with such people. Is the reasoning of the Grand Inquisitor supposed to have revealed a basic contradiction between the spirit of truth and the spirit of institutions? Is it supposed to be a universal law that in the attempt to make the truth into a state religion, truth must turn itself into its complete opposite? Does not everything speak for the view that the Grand Inquisitor's logic has triumphed according to which a returned Jesus would be burned on the pyre of the Holy Inquisition? A returned Nietzsche perish in the gas chambers? A returned Marx rot alive in the Siberian labour camp? Is there a law that regulates such cynically tragic inversions? The 19th century, as we have said, is the epoch of the great realistic theories that fix a down-to-earth gaze, unconcerned about good and evil, on that part of the world that is relevant for human beings. History, the state, power, class struggles, ideologies, natural forces, sexuality, the family. All these bodies of knowledge are now ordered into a great theoretical arsenal, into the tall emporium of practical interests. Knowledge is power, says the workers' movement. But to the extent that, on the one side, the instruments are stacked up, on the other, the plans grow. Here the tools, there the designs. Here the matter-of-fact neutralised means, there the grandiose utopian good ends. Here the facts, there the values. This is, in outline, the self-understanding of modern instrumentalism or pragmatism. With one foot in the area beyond good and evil, one feels around for, with the other foot, for a firm stand in utopian morality. Concisely stated, the 19th century develops a first form of modern cynical consciousness that links a rigorous cynicism of means with an equally rigid moralism of ends. For as far as the goods for as far as the ends were concerned, scarcely anyone risked imagining a real region beyond good and evil, for that would be nihilism. Resisting nihilism is the real ideological war of modernity. If fascism and communism struggle somewhere on a common front, it is on the front against nihilism, which with one voice is attributed to bourgeois decadence. Common to both is the resoluteness to oppose the nihilistic trend with an absolute value. Here, the people's utopia. There, the communist utopia. Both guarantee a final end that sanctifies every means and that promises to give meaning to existence. However, where radical cynicism and means come together with a resolute moralism of ends, there, the last residue of moral feeling for the means dies out. Modern, heavily armed moralism works itself up into an unheard of destructive whirlwind and drives the hell of good intentions to an extreme. This must not be understood as a theoretical deduction. To be sure, we have tried to sketch a logic of modern political catastrophes, but this attempt is preceded by the real catastrophes. No thinking on its own could summon up enough frivolity and despair to come to such conclusions merely out of a striving for truth. In fact, basically, no human being would be able to imagine devastations of the magnitude of those experienced if they had not actually happened. In retrospect, attention is just now being drawn to the intellectual preconditions of the political calamity. Looking back, one can ask what conditions made the self-made hell possible. This hell really must have come about before thinking should overcome its timidity and inertia and begin to investigate the grammar of the catastrophes. The only ones to anticipate the logic of large-scale catastrophes, Nietzsche and Dostoevsky, basically did not yet know the extent to which they spoke of politics as they carried out their torturous thought experiments. 
For this reason, they spoke almost exclusively in moral, psychological terms and understood themselves as the last in a centuries-old religious tradition. What they wrote was incubated in a religiously stamped, psychologically exposed inwardness. Both understood themselves as explosions in the Christian tradition, as comets at the end of history of religion to that point, leading over to a bleak modernity. But the political transposition of their visions in both cases occurred within two generations. Thought out beforehand in inwardness, the structures described by Nietzsche and Dostoevsky gained fulfilment in the most brutal manifestations. The Russian Grand Inquisitor of the 20th century really existed, as did the German populist Übermensch. Both instrumentalists in the grand style, cynical to the extreme as far as the means are concerned, pseudo-naively moral with regards to the ends. In the meantime, we have come so far from our starting point that it might seem as if no connection at all existed any longer between Diogenes, the proto kinnic and the Grand Inquisitor, the modern cynic. Only through an inexplicable quirk in the history of concepts, so it seems, does modern cynicism hark back to the ancient school of philosophy. However, in this apparent quirk, a bit of method can be made clear. A link connecting dissimilar phenomena over millennia. This link, so we believe, consists in two formal common points between kinicism and cynicism. The first is the motif of self-preservation in crisis-ridden times. The second a kind of shameless, dirty realism without regard for conventional moral inhibitions, declares itself to be for how things really are. Compared with the existential realism of ancient kinicism, however, modern cynicism is only the half of a whole, for its sense of facts, as shown, is directed only towards an unscrupulous, matter-of-fact way of dealing with means to an end not towards the ends themselves. Modern, theoretically reflecting grand cynics like the Grand Inquisitor are anything but descendants of Diogenes. In them, rather, gnaws the ambition of Alexander, whom Diogenes had rebuffed. It is, of course, a displaced kind of ambition, where Diogenes expressed the wish, stop blocking my son, those skilled at modern cynicism strive for a place in the sun. They think of nothing else than to cynically, in the sense of openly ruthless, scramble for earthly goods, which Diogenes had rejected with disdain. And for them, literally any means is justified, to the point of genocide, plundering of the earth, devastation of land and sea, decimation of fauna, showing that the, with regard to the instrumental, they have really put themselves beyond good and evil. But where is the chemical impulse to be found? If cynicism has already become an unavoidable aspect of modern realism, why does this realism not also encompass the ends? The cynicism of the means that characterises our instrumental reason, to quote Horkheimer. It can be compensated for only by a return to a kinicism of the ends. This means taking leave of the spirit of long-term goals. Insight into the original purposelessness of life. Limiting the wish for power and the power of wishing. In a word, comprehending the legacy of Diogenes. This is neither a romanticism of rubbish bins, nor a gushy enthusiasm for the simple life. The essence of kinicism consists in a critical, ironical philosophy of so-called needs, in the elucidation of their fundamental excess and absurdity. The kinical impulse not only was alive from Diogenes to the Stoa, but also had its effect on Jesus himself, the troublemaker par excellence, and in all real disciples of the Master who, like him, were illuminated by the insight into the purposelessness of existence. 
This is the basis for the puzzling influence of old Asian teachings of wisdom that fascinate the West because they coolly turn their backs on its ideology of purposes and all its rationalizations of greed. On earth existence has nothing to search for except itself. But where cynicism rules, we search for everything, but not for existence, design. Before we really live, we always have just one more matter to attend to, just one more precondition to fulfill, just one more temporarily more important wish to satisfy, just one more account to settle. And with this, just one more and one more and one more arises, that structure of postponement and indirect living that keeps the system of excessive production going. The latter, of course, always knows how to present itself as an unconditionally good end that deludes us with its light as though it were a real goal, but that, whenever we approach it, recedes once more into the distance. Chemical reason culminates in the knowledge, decried as nihilism, that we must snub the grand goals. In this regard, we cannot be nihilistic enough. Those who reject all so-called goals and values in a chemical sense break with the circle of instrumental reason, in which good goals are pursued with bad means. The means lie in our hands, and they are the means with such enormous significance in every respect, production, organisation, as well as destruction, that we must begin to ask ourselves whether there can still be any ends that are served by the means. For what good, then, could such immeasurable means be necessary? In that moment when our consciousness becomes ripe to let go of the idea of good as a goal and to devote itself to what is already there, a release is possible in which the piling up of means for imaginary always receding goals automatically become superfluous. Cynicism can only be stemmed by kinicism, not by morality. Only a joyful kinicism of ends is never tempted to forget that life has nothing to lose except itself. Since in this chapter we have spoken a lot about great spirits who have returned, it would be appropriate finally for us to imagine a returned Diogenes. The philosopher cry, climbs out of his Athenian tub and enters the 20th century, gets caught up in two world wars, strolls through the principal cities of capitalism and communism, reads up on the East-West conflict, listens to lectures on nuclear strategy, the theory of surplus value and value-added tax, visits television stations, gets caught in the vacation traffic on the freeways, sits rolling his eyes in a Hegel seminar, Has Diogenes come to disrupt? It seems more likely that he himself is rather disturbed. He had taught, be ready for anything, but what he now sees goes too far even for him. He had found even the Athenians to be pretty crazy, but what he finds in the present defies classification. Stalingrad, Auschwitz, Hiroshima. He longs to go back to the Persian Wars. Out of fear of psychiatric institutions, Diogenes refrains from going through the streets by day with a lantern. If philosophical pantomime fails, even he would not know how to talk to these people. He has noticed that they have been drilled to understand what is complicated, not what is simple. He has fathomed that, for them, what is perverse appears normal. What to do? Suddenly he gets a feeling he never had, back then in Athens, to have something important to say. At that time, everything had been almost like a game. Now, however, it seems to him that something serious should be made of it. With a sigh, Diogenes agrees to play along with the game. From now on, he will try to be respectable as far as he can. He will also learn modern philosophical jargon and play with words until people become giddy. And genuinely, subversively, with a deadly earnest air, he will try to spread his ridiculously simple message among his contemporaries. 
He knows that thinking in the sense of the cynicism of means has become his potential pupil's artful. He knows that thinking in the sense of the cynicism of means has made his potential pupils artful and their critical understanding functions superbly. The philosopher who teaches the kinicism of ends must be a match for this understanding. That is Diogenes' concession to modernity. Two paths present themselves for undermining the modern use of understanding in the sciences and technologies, the ontological and the dialectical. Diogenes has tried both incognito. It is up to us to decipher his traces.